I'd almost forgotten this one. It's part 13 of the possibly never-ending series of two-hour interviews with Sean Atwood. In this, I was invited to one of Sean's safe houses. I've been to a few of those in the past, uh, not Sean's, but one thing safe houses have in common, you have to bring your own food. What did we speak about this time around? Extreme people, hidden people, surviving hard times, enjoying good times. Not that there were many of those. Anyway, part 13. All yours. To our most reoccurring podcast guest ever. 13's not unlucky for me, Sean. Just like you've got waves of the thing going around the world, David keeps coming back. Oh, correct. (laughs) <laughs> what, some illness, monkey pox. <laughs> I'm starting to scratch already. If you're not familiar with David Macmillan and his epic story that 13 episodes have not even contained, there's going to be many more. We've no, got, he's got... As long as I can stay propped up on the, the chair, <laughs> that's, that's mostly it. You may have seen him in Lad Bible, uh, Business Insider, this channel, millions of views now combined. And he's also the prolific author of two books. It's not prolific, but there is something new in that, isn't there, Sean? And you're holding it in your mitt. Prolific by way of all of the different... Formats. The formats. formats. <laughs> <laughs> the hardback is now available for Unforgiving Destiny. Now, before we do pick up from where we left off, I'll just read the back of Unforgiving Destiny. For those of you who are not familiar with David and... You're a dying breed. Um, (laughs) Unforgiving Destiny follows the true story of the 37-year pursuit, hence Mm, two dozen podcasts in the making, 37-year pursuit by authorities on five continents to imprison and execute... They were keen on that part. (laughs) David Mack as he travelled as an independent smuggler, dogged by an obsessed DEA agent, and it's hilarious... When David goes and visits his gravestone, what happens there? Mm -hmm. Um, David was jailed in Australia and faced the death penalty in Thailand before escaping prison only to be captured again in Pakistan after crossing Mm -hmm. the Afghan border. And his girlfriend died in Australian prison as well in a fire, which is quite a dramatic part of the whole story and a complete tragedy. Recovering from each downfall... Macmillan rebuilds his life and network from the ashes time and time, only to find the same agency faces behind the next arrest. In this private history, readers are taken to the streets of New York City and Colombia, then through the war zones of Afghanistan, the torture cells in Karachi. During this time, David balances a double life of a London gentleman Hmm. with the women in his life oblivious to his true nature. just well, oblivious, <laughs> yes. And though hardback available now, link in description box. Yeah, it'll stabilize a coffee cup uh, quite well. That and doesn't leave stains. <laughs> Important thing when cleaning up a hard, dark hardcover. Right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, not entirely oblivious. Yes, the women in my life were oblivious, except for uh, the one who stuck with me for the last twenty years, Jeanette, who uh, is. Not oblivious, contemptuous, you know, um, <laughs> doesn't care and prefers me to stay out of prison. That's why I retired a dozen years because ago. Because they tried to nab him in recent years and send him back to Thailand for the death penalty. We've not got to that story yet. Uh, no, no, it's sort of, uh, you know, who it ties episode in Episode 15, 16, is that? I guess so. But it does tie in with a, another uh, recurring guest of yours, Peter Tritton. Ooh. It was he whom I met inside the prison, uh, and it was just by chance. Now, I know Kevin Bacon made a thing out of pointing out the six degrees of separation between everybody in the world. It only takes six steps to get from the Queen of England to a rice farmer in China. But within the criminal world, I think it's about three, because many times uh, I found myself somewhere and come across somebody who knew somebody else that I did. Now, you might say, oh, so what, if we're in some big London nick or something. But this was, um, in one example, a 30-cell tiny prison in Denmark. 
And this guy was, um, what part of the Arab world? I think he was Syrian or something like that. And he knew people that I knew in the Bangkok prison. So that's very small. Um, but I suppose um, that's why people end up, I mean, you, you must have found your contacts back in your day kind of knew either of each other or directly. Well, you're in a prison. It's a lonely world. And when you find someone who you know or know someone you know, you got that instant connection. You feel better, don't you? No, it doesn't. And, <laughs> and even <clears throat> if you're in a, a foreign prison and you find a countryman, um, countryman, yeah, that that can be a good thing. Until, yeah. of course, the disappointment is later on you find out the guy's no good. But yeah, you know. is that um, where we is that where we left off? Scandinavia, where we were. Have oh, you got a okay. recap? A recap um, sheet down there. A kind of, but our, where we are. <clears throat> in these series, um, we've dealt with all of Asia and Thailand and um, most of Afghanistan and Pakistan. <clears throat> and I'd gone back, you may remember, to um, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and that turned into a disaster of its own. Lord. Uh, Lord Nord John Magsy, sort of. I don't know whether he got me out or made things worse for me, but he did something. <clears throat> and I was acquitted. Somebody asked me the other day, how many times have I been arrested? Twelve. Hmm. You'd think a little more. Um, I don't call an overnighter an arrest. I mean, <laughs> we won't count that one. But only actually convicted four times uh, and acquitted. I like about um, hmm, four or five times acquitted. So... I must be wrongly accused, Sean. Uh, or is that a credit to your system <clears throat> playing abilities? Um, I do like a jury. Uh, <laughs> a judge once stopped um, the four of us in a very long trial uh, because the jury were coming in after lunch before his honour. So we had this kind of... And I said to the guys, look, we've got this kind of embarrassing silence where the show hasn't started, but the jury are there staring at us or not. We've got to do something. So we started singing. A cappella songs, of course. We didn't have a band. And the Nylons had a big hit at the time with I'm Not That Kind of Guy. <laughs> <clears throat> and we did pretty well, I think. Um, I was talking to one of the singers the other day, Brendan, who was acquitted uh, after this six-month trial in, in, in Australia. And he ended up as a, a counsellor in... Uh, New South Wales, a kind of hippie colony now, kind of middle-class bourgeoisie, all of that. And I thought, um, really, <clears throat> uh, I'd kind of explain a little more today about some of the people, because what's a story without uh, windbagging on about myself? When's Brendan coming on the <clears throat> podcast? i got to kind of talk him into it. At the moment... Have you um, watched any of your podcasts? Uh, a couple of them. And, Hi, Brendan. Uh, Come on. Uh, Brendan. Join yeah, us. Yeah. Zoom, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, what a guy to make as a, a, a counsellor and psychologist. He was... Uh, you know, he, look, if anybody ever finds himself witness to a trial, <clears throat> never fear the bizarre defence. Uh, we ran for him the full-on... Um, CIA dark ops thing and it, it played out because the, the and this was the first appearance of Bill Shankman in my life <clears throat> he turned up in Australia for the trial uh, and he was from the DEA of course and was tied up with the I think he was number four in Thailand in the opium um, trade up there um, and so overloaded poor old Brendan's case, he brought in a witness to say that uh, there were 44-gallon drums flopping over with heroin and all of that kind of stuff, which doesn't really flop. But um, uh, the, and the witnesses were so flaky um, that one, for example, gave this, and he called himself Miche, just one word. I'd never met the guy. We hadn't met each other. That's the beauty of a conspiracy case, Sean. You, you don't know anybody. Meet them in court. <clears throat> Miche uh, said that he'd witnessed all these 
crazy things with warlords in the Golden Triangle. This is back in the late 70s. And the name struck, I mean, Will calls himself Miche, and he seemed a little unique, shall we say, in his personality. And Brendan, being like full-on hippie to the extreme, wouldn't call anybody out for being doing something unusual. <clears throat> and then I found out what Miche's secret was. So the lawyer, his lawyer was able to say, after listening to the stream of accusations from Miche, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Miche, um, back at the time, your appearance was somewhat different in those days, was it not? Huh? Well, the colour scheme, shall we say dress, does that ring anything? And of course, then he had to admit he was getting around Southeast Asia as a full-on cross-dressing drag queen. <clears throat> did that harm Brendan's defence? I don't think it did. <laughs> and when he was acquitted, he was so shocked. Uh, we had to push him out the door before he got arrested. But let's bring things back to date, shall we? All of that's behind me now. Well, there one was... sec, I'm just going to open that window over there. <clears throat> it's, it's <clears throat> gonna... Yes, no, it's, uh, it's if, if we're still, still filming, uh, Sean's mm -hmm. going to... Uh, th there are fans of his clawing at the window. They've uh, scaled up to the studio. <laughs> Throw them a rope, why don't you? <clears throat> so, um, this whole episode in... Um, Pakistan it was very draining. It took two years. Um, I'd uh, before I was acquitted, uh, I'd been disappeared. So there was the time spent in um, Hyderabad prison. There, I was really kind of exhausted by this. In strange way, even escaping from Thailand was less exhausting than this because. It was such a clear target. Uh, prison inside it, wall, get outside it. That, that's all it was, you know, full of its uh, <clears throat> dangers. But this thing in Pakistan was like, even if you were out, you were never out. What was the difference? You know, the, famously, there was a banker in there that didn't want to get out because he built a house in the place with air conditioning and servants because he knew, having stolen $250 million from the Mehran Bank, He'd be kidnapped straight away, so it was safe for him. But I returned to London and did what I had done. I added them up this morning, Sean, six times before, rebuilt a, a new existence. Um, the shabby documentation that had brought me back to uh, London. Oh, I remember it now. It was actually in my own name, David McMillan. Yeah, a passport. I it, it's, I could never bring it out without flinching, you know. You found I, yourself, finally. Yeah, and it had a lot of 13s in it, the number, too. Um, and very grudgingly issued by the um, uh, some honorary consul in Karachi. They didn't, wanted to know why I wasn't at the airport in handcuffs being thrown out, because I'd been bailed out. I was running around Karachi, which was fun. As I say, all behind me, I rented two flats. Um, one in Sloan Avenue, and that's Kensington, and another one across the road, um, which was like a studio apartment. Its virtue was, and the reason I'm mentioning it is because in setting up a life again, um, the old habits of protecting yourself stay there. So I'd have the, the, the one apartment which had two or three ways out, but the studio across the road, I could get to in about 40 seconds, and that had an underground car park. It even had petrol bowsers down there, and you'd you know, drive in empty. Uh, and very confusing layout, which is great. You know, you... Um, this had you, had, you, had you adopted the Colombian system of the caletas, which is secreting yourself into the wall? Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, now I've kind of got a fear of um, for another foreign word, oubliette, the French practice of throwing somebody down a tube in a dungeon, <laughs> wedged in there, and that's it. <laughs> Forget about it. Click. Um, <clears throat> 
No, I can understand how that would work. I knew a builder once who would always um, construct the living dining room kitchen at odd angles so it would leave a space in between. You could open up a panel and go into But uh, I'm glad you reminded me. I must, uh, next renovation I do, I'm going to position myself one. And if you want to read more about Coletta's Son of the Cali Cartel, we've published the book. Check it out. Who's the son? Um, William Rodriguez. Oh, that guy who's been speaking a bit about... But he speaks English quite well, doesn't he? Are you thinking of Pablo Escobar's son? We've had him. Oh, on. maybe, yes, I probably This have. is the son. So the two brothers, or the main brothers of the cartel, was um, Miguel and um, his brother. And they went to the feds, and then the son was running it. Mm. So William was running it. So he wrote a book called Son of the Cali Cartel, which we've, we've just published in the English-speaking world. Yeah. Good move to make. Yeah. Uh, I always enjoy reading your South American stories. Well, they've got to correct Narcos and Netflix, haven't we? Uh, <laughs> that's true. DEA, good old DEA being the heroes and all. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's always another side to things, isn't there? <laughs> so uh, I have the uh, two apartments and uh, <clears throat> don't get a car. It's never a good thing. All it is is a... Um, a mobile station for your opposition to keep track of your movements. Uh, other people's cars, on the other hand, fine, if you need them. But um, really, um, you can't do better than London's um, travel network, normally pretty good. In fact, the Tube network saved my life. I don't, know, I don't think I've ever told you. <clears throat> Many years ago, when would this be? Uh, late 90s, I guess. Uh, I arrived um, and I had two passports. One was a regular sort of thing. <clears throat> the other one was a um, what they used to call a British visitor's passport. You get her to the post office, over the counter, give them a photo, a birth certificate, stamped, crunch, it's yours. It was only good for Europe. But and what it was much better for was showing customs officers because if they saw it, they go, where's he been? Source country? No. Yeah, well, you're supposed to actually show it to them. Instead, I pulled out the wrong one, <clears throat> which has got Bangkok stamped all over it. Not good. So I was um, quite a few hours in there, uh, and they got so close, Sean. Wow. If their toolbox had have a had a proper set of Allen keys, I would have been a goner. What uh, did you have on you? Mm, well, um, I had a, kind of a, a bit of a mixed package because it was the, so there was um, two kilos of Coke and a kilo of smack, which, you know, takes a bit of explaining away, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I've got a nasty habit. Uh, and they were about uh, uh, a quarter of a, an inch a, away from it. Where was it? <clears throat> it was in um, a kind of a um, amplifier. It was still possible at that time to get around with electronic equipment into it. And it was in sub boxes within it. And they were glued in place. But you couldn't actually get into this thing without either smashing it to pieces or having very unique screwdrivers. Uh, if anybody's ever changed um, an iPhone battery, uh, which they make very difficult, <laughs> and they don't want you to do it, you'll have to find um, a tricorn screwdriver, for example. Yeah, it's got three curved pointy bits going around the tiny what, thing. What about the X-ray? Um, X-ray didn't do any good because um, even though it was um, both of those things, the narcotics were uh, organic. The surrounds, it had a wooden casing, which is organic, so it, it wouldn't distinguish it. So that, and also shaped to, to fit in with large capacitors and stuff like that. So they just didn't have the stomach for smashing it to pieces and thought instead, all right, we're pretty convinced. Let's see where this bugger goes. Uh, scoundrel, we'll let him go. And I, I went out. Um, there were some taxi drivers there, but I had already seen that this, the front driver was 
dismissing fares and sending them to the one behind, then two behind. So I went up to him. Come in. <laughs> yeah, like hell I will. <laughs> Sorry, mate. Stone broke after too many, you know, street girls in Amsterdam or whatever I said. <clears throat> Got out, went onto the underground system and went to um, everybody's favorite back in those days, well, I think if they gave it any thought, which was if you need to lose somebody, <clears throat> the underground is good not only because you can jump on and off in the French Connection style, but um, you have certain stations that lend themselves to uh, great difficulties. Firstly, th there's no cars. They're on foot. They have no advantage, your followers, uh, over you. You go to um, Bank Station. That has a tunnel going to Monument Station. Now, there, other than that tunnel, there is no faster way to do it. If they want to, the people behind you, if they want to sort of disappear for a bit and reappear, that means they've got to go to the surface and, and they'll be finished then. So <clears throat> I did that and um, then um, went to another one, walked under the, the Thames at some point. Uh, <clears throat> a, a word of caution here for people following my footsteps, uh, they're very... <laughs> deep rutted footsteps to follow in in general terms but also um, just because something's a tunnel doesn't mean it's good I mean um, you know the Woolwich tunnel in London uh, oh no it's a Woolwich ferry what's what is it the rather height that runs under that I'm not that familiar actually mm, okay well it's um, <clears throat> it takes cars and it smells like a I don't know, public toilet from the 1950s, if you walk down at that dank riverine smell. Now, you think the tunnel, good, they can't get to the other side of it, but it's not the case. If the tunnel's too long, it, it, it negates the whole thing. But anyway, <clears throat> those kind of days were behind me, I said. We're coming up to, after 2001, I've got my new place. Um, I shouldn't be getting into too much trouble, should I? What's your cash position at this point? Um, well, it's kind of getting... It, it was good uh, up until... Um, it, before I fell into a deep, dark hole in Pakistan, it was very good. I had a muse house in Chelsea. I had um, two self-storage lockers uh, around town. All... <laughs> flush with uh, lever arch folders um, with different currencies inside them um, into the in, in the muse house all the, a lot of the walls in the stairway up and down had panels in them which you unscrew and that was sort of my personal banking um, oh and a, an account with um, a Spanish bank whose name I'll leave out of the story uh, that had a goodly amount of money you know? Well, did you say that was depleted during your incarcerations? Um, no, I did what you shouldn't do. I mean, firstly, if you take a safety deposit box or you've got something buried somewhere, sensibly take it for a decade if you can possibly pay that far in advance because you're not sending anybody there because what will happen is what happened to me. Uh, you sent somebody. I sent somebody to the, the storage locker and uh, they had a good time. <laughs> yeah, they had a very good time. Oh. Mm. <clears throat> they, uh, um, I really did, I didn't, okay, the money was secondary there. I needed some documentation. I needed passports. I shouldn't have been panicking. You know, it's, it's amazing what will just go away given enough time. I think um, the world of... Um, crime in general, and certainly smuggling in particular, is not for those who haven't got the patience to sit out two years. Now, you get to a certain point in your life, like my agedness, I haven't got two years to spare. You know? um, but, you know, panic, and, and, and there's no point to hiding something somewhere unless uh, you're prepared to sit it out. But I didn't. So, was I in desperate need to do anything? Um, not 
Initially, it wasn't too bad. There was a few bits of drugs, and I, I didn't really, didn't feel, really feel inclined. But I also got a little bored easily enough. So um, when I got a call from uh, the wife of an old friend, Emil, who lives in Denmark, uh, he'd done me a few favors. But then again, I'd done him some. He was. Um, he'd, he'd got out of something that turned terrible and then I'd helped him, but he'd helped me. But, you know, it sounded kind of intriguing. And these people were in Christiania. Now, for those who watched the 12, I think we spoke about it. But in essence, it's, um, it's an old army barracks that was taken over where are we, 2022, back in, uh, might have even been as early as the late 60s, by a hippie commune. Uh, full counterculture lifestyle, no rules. But you can imagine um, you don't have to go too far left on the political spectrum into uh, where people say, oh, we have no rules here. We every, Everybody takes personal responsibility. There will soon enough be the most lengthy and specific rules listed, uh, which there was there. They make uh, quite a thing of um, uh, issuing hard drugs there, whatever that means. I, I think it's a bit like what it used to be for gays in the military. Uh, don't talk about it, because a lot of them um, were role players and they had... Uh, they had a bit of a fondness for the A-class drugs and, and higher. <laughs> so, <clears throat> but it was uh, a functioning little society by 2000. Was it legal? No. Did the Danish government tolerate it? More or less. It was a bit of a tourist draw. I think it, it may still be. Um, certainly then what's called Pusher Street, which is a kind of... Um, courtyard in the middle had um, trailer caravans with drop down sites. You know, that kind of place you might get a hot dog uh, like that. And they'd sell um, varieties of hash from all over. Um, surprisingly, not much weed. I think it was so bulky they, they didn't bother. But there were backroom deals all over uh, for that. <coughs> there are uh, Two main ways in to this old army barracks from main doors and a side entrance, which is the best one to take if you're planning a visit. Uh, you'll know it because um, they <laughs> where they've got uniform police around the front trying to put the frightness on people. Um, this side entrance has just one plain clothes spook car. It doesn't stop anybody from getting in. They're just kind of curious to know who it is. <clears throat> uh, so you call in there, um, I went in, uh, disguised, not really, just one of those coats that you turn inside out, the hat that comes off, that kind of thing, and made one, my way to um, what would have been, you know, it was two floors up on part of the old barracks. If I had been there back when the place first started, it probably would have been a, pretty ramshackle dormitory blankets on the floor, kids screaming, pooing in the corner, God knows what, um, you know, cooking going on another. But years have gone by, and this sort of Christianian nobility um, gathering of three, where I was invited, the place had been renovated slicker than a Thames-side uh, warehouse that you might find down in the Docklands in London. Um, all the floors have been polished back and uh, the, the furniture in the middle of this large space and shaded windows. I think the furniture was in the large space because they didn't like to talk near walls. They have... Uh, every country has its own unique fear of listening devices, don't they? Um, and yet every country has people that ignore them. You know, the Hatton Garden um, um, safe deposit robbers here. Old 
school players from way back sat in cars and had a little natter about the whole job. Completely nuts. In, in, in America, <coughs> in the um, drug community, it was always the Cox cable van. If there was a Cox cable van on your street, oh, like, that was it. they that were was listening them. to you. <laughs> oh, right. And that was one of the t- uh, cable TV companies. Was yes. It? Oh, okay. Yes. <coughs> this was, true. This was in, the, in the 1990s. In the, when you were there, did they have this thing about um, if it's the federal cops, the antennas on the, on the cars they use, they have a little a pigtail antenna on the back? No, but they did have their own antennae rules. Ah, right. <laughs> of course, if they're doing deep surveillance, they'll just use regular cars and an old coat hanger for an antenna if it suits them. And they had their own window tinting rules as well. <laughs> really? Yeah. <clears throat> and still managed to get recorded. Really dark tints with multiple antennas. That's it. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. No, it would be. Um, it's surprising that all these um, um, precautions are put about as though they, uh, it's going to help, and yet people fall into something like the great EncroChat um, secure mobile phone thing, which was... Well, it wasn't a complete Trojan horse. It wasn't like they set it up from the beginning, but it was put about as a secure phone device you could use. And it was kind of slick. It was a Google Pixel phone. Press a couple of buttons and it comes up as a, an ordinary Android. Um, and, uh, yeah, sure, it was encrypted, but the server that was um, running it was in France somewhere. And the FBI managed to get into that, so they got everybody. Like six, seven, I think maybe more than a thousand villains all uh, chatting away. And they only closed it down when some of them were getting kind of suspicious at the, the kind of pinpoint arrests. I mean, that's the thing. If you're on, let's put ourselves in the policeman's shoes, rather tight fit, but... Uh, it's like when we crack the codes and we let the ship sink. Exactly. Um, the, oh, here's my drink. Um, the, the Enigma code you're talking about and so much information about where the German shipping is, you can, if you interfere with everything, they'd get suspicious. Why is it they knew? They must have cracked our codes. So you have to you know, keep your powder dry and then uh, <clears throat> Choose your moments, I guess, which is not very happy for the poor bastards. So, so David, what do you say to these young people out there who think that the police can't get anything from any electronic device? They think that they can't get it because what? Because it's encrypted. They think that a text message disappears or they delete it, so the police can't retrieve it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, these people do exist. <laughs> they believe such a thing. Yeah. <laughs> think that disappearing messages. Um, no. Means the police can't retrieve I it. I would um, suggest that they contemplate this. If you open up a um, Gmail account, which is free, um, they give you 15 gigabyte of free storage. And it doesn't hurt them a bit, despite the billions of people who have Gmail accounts. With that amount of storage, does anybody seriously think that anything gets deleted? Uh, if it goes into WhatsApp, it's it's there. What, all that the encryption means is that the people who eventually find a way to read your messages on the forces of law and order, and perhaps a rung above, you know, the, the people who get into it might be at a, at a higher level. But um, there is no... Um, there is no better way if you want to keep something private uh, than meeting in person. It's like having an extramarital affair. You, you, you keep off the phone for that one. It's all you can do. And if you're the kind that seems to somehow benefit from grubby little text messages between you and your new floozy, well, be prepared to answer in the court of the wife, <laughs> which will be more harsh than any uh, <laughs> scales of justice you might find elsewhere. Uh, no, they wouldn't. But I mean, and here's an example. When I'd returned back where we are in, in 2001, the numbers that I had, they weren't using any particular uh, encryption. I was doing it in a rather old-fashioned way, you could say, 
who would look so now, by just opening a Gmail account, uh, composing a draft letter, uh, but never sending it, just keeping it in drafts. And that letter, the, the whole sheet of it, would be the numbers. Some of the more <clears throat> important ones um, might be have a, a simple code on it, but... Um, Oddly enough, that was one of the methods the Cali Cartel employed as well, was the old draft emails. Was it? Yes. You see, the simple is, is best. <laughs> Though I'm, I'm guessing that probably didn't come as inspiration from the top down. I'm thinking uh, some of their nerd brigade probably did that one. Um, uh, I was pleased to see an old post box that I had on... Um, the corner of South Kensington Station. It had a phone shop there, and they had a little row of um, hire it yourself post boxes, but nobody used them much. So the the one I had, and I guess probably a hundred other people had the same key to, uh, was still there. It wasn't the mail that was in there. It was the false panel above uh, the post box that was held by magnets that you had to pull down with a stronger magnet. <clears throat> but uh, <clears throat> I didn't really trust any of the documentation I had. Um, in fact, I, it was the first experience I'd had of traveling under my own name. <sighs> Not to be recommended, Sean, I can tell you. I, the Swiss stopped me a couple of times, and the Germans. That's his last papers, <laughs> and all of that. They, I, I had, uh, we should keep in mind, um, an Interpol blue notice. Not a red. A red means arrest on site. The blue notice is detain and inquire and get what you can. You know, local address, stupid stuff. So I, I had a business card made up um, which gave the Wen, uh, an address as the Wan Chai district in Hong Kong, which was still and, and not long passed back to China. And we know no good came of that. <laughs> uh, why didn't we trust the Chinese? Oh, it's strange. Uh, not much we can do these days, but of saber rattling, that's about it. That um, threat of uh, giving four million Hong Kongers uh, British passports is an empty one, so China doesn't care. I, so when I arrived in um, the renovated digs in um, Christiania, I was appraised of... Emil's situation, uh, and he was in prison. And it's very easy to get into a Danish prison. It's quite a struggle to get out of one until you're convicted. Once you say, sorry, I did it, it all's all forgiven. Uh, they more or less, uh, even if planning are giving you some time, it, it's open prison, and they want you to go out every day and work. It's not like, it's a real hardship. But if you're not admitting to your sinfulness, it's solitary confinement. So nobody could see Emil. I mean, yes, if you wanted to visit somebody who was being held in custody, was it visit at the jail? No. They had to go into the police station and um, you had to get permission from the cops to sit in the policeman's office and have a little natter and you wouldn't allowed to talk about the case. So they tune in every so often, and uh, no, maybe that, not that. So you had to talk in a very roundabout way uh, um, for things. So there wasn't much information for Emil situ his, his problems, except that this was the deal. It was um, 12 tons of hash uh, from near where my old friends were in Baluchistan, but it, it came from further north and across the Afghan border, going by, well, of course, ship. And as soon as um, the guy, uh, Pierre Mons, was the Danish guy who was in kind of charge of transportation, they do like their little sections there within that Scandinavian crook world. Um, he... Um, he laid out for me how many different groups were involved, uh, Latvians, Russians. <laughs> yeah, you know, things aren't going to go so great when there's Russians involved. <laughs> they, uh, and not, a, not any people I knew, um, but 
it's a, it's a very big, I suppose, in all in government, aren't they? The 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 uh, Novotny, Black Noise, I forget. It's kind of like the words for a um, street gangster uh, turned politician. There's not much of a difference there. So the the hash had been loaded onto the Kabadna, um, which was flying a, or running anyway um, a UAE flag in the, in the Gulf down in Guada. <clears throat> I knew of Guada because it's a dismal little port town. There's been talk for years and years of running a gas pipeline there. There's been talk of building it up into something. It could have been, had one of their prime ministers in Pakistan survived the gallows, which he did not. Um, Ali Bhutto, yeah. They hanged him before he could carry this out, but uh, he's a bit of a drinker, careless. Um, he wanted to make Guadalajara port area into a kind of Dubai at the time, you know, with casinos and duty-free shopping. But instead it remained just a grisly little place. And I'd looked at it before, you know, up to no good, thinking, hmm, what kind of goes from here? But my guide in these matters, uh, his lordship, uh, John Magsy, said, no, 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 you, you can't, they all know. Who knows? Everybody knows. So, you know, he'd pointed already out to me that the Pakistan Intelligence Service, the ISI, they had their noses to the ground down here. Um, the two different intelligence services of the United States, including Navy intelligence, uh, kept an eye on the place. It was very strategically located, just near Socotra and the, and the entrance to the Gulf, and heading onto the Red Sea. So it struck me as a, not the greatest place to be loading up anything anyway. Nor John um, said that if I wanted to run anything out of that part, it would be better to go up the coast and use the, um, um, the traditional Arab uh, ships like the Dows, you know, they've got a sail and they're quite small. And oh, they have a motor, of course, but it's only a kind of a, a day and a half to get from there to Dubai, so you know, it's quite close. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, in a very blatant kind of bit of business, um, having your own boat there. Karachi Port was not so far away. They're open for business 24-7. If you wanted to have 12 tons of hash through there, I'm sure nobody would get too upset about it. They'd, they'd want you to pay them the courtesy of actually packing it in something that made it didn't reek to high heaven and rattle around in the... Chet, um, watch our podcast with Chet Sandu if you want to see what happens in Karachi. Yeah, he had... Uh, what was that hotel? Do you remember the name of hotel? Was it the Avari? No. When we wake up in the morning, we get out of bed and we start our day with Koro Snacks. Koro is a healthy snacks brand focusing on bringing additive-free natural ingredients to their customers with fair prices in bulk packaging. They have everything from nut butters to free from baking ingredients to cooking essentials and, of course, the snacks. And the energy balls are delicious. Oh, they're my favourite, the salted pistachio. Ooh. Um, make that this morning. Let's see what this one tastes like. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> mm. Mm. So what makes Coro special in comparison to others? Their bulk packaging allow them to offer their customers high quality products at a fair price. For a 5% discount on Coro's products, use the code TRUECRIME with no space in between true and crime. The link to Coro's online shop is in the description box on YouTube. Thanks for supporting our sponsor. Yeah. Okay. When the police we... chief came, that's where you hooked up with the police chief. With the the police chief was going with the girls. And well, the, they the, got the Madame, Hyatt. the Madame, and the, really. what was it called? Hyatt, Marriott, and uh, Pearl Continental, maybe. That's known for. Uh... This was had some dodgy name. This one. Oh, what he went to some dive. Oh, okay. it, it, it was like Hotel Bust Me. <laughs> Well, the police chief went there to go with the, the working goes. women. Ah, oh, right. And that's how Chet got the protection of the police chief. Mm. That's how he met him. And um, when Chet got pulled over by the military or something, he had the police chief's card and he gave him, that's how he got out of trouble. 
No, man. Yeah. Well, he did well just to car. Usually it's card and 500 rupees wrapped around it. Would help. Self made, dues paid. Chet Sandu's book out now. Is that a new one? That's not his We've just published one. it for him. Oh, did you? <laughs> you write it for him too? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, oh, Chet. No, I'm, I'm, sure, <laughs> I'm sure it's all his own words. <laughs> Somewhat edited. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that was all bad enough. But what about the Kavadna, the little fearless ship? Where did that come from? Ah, the Latvians came up with it, and it was um, and it, uh, the Russians had actually supplied it. Yeah. <clears throat> so, how can I help? Was what I was saying. Well, um, you, I knew as much that in a Danish court there was not an awful lot of help you could do there, but um, everybody you know, wanted to know um, why they'd lost 12 tons of hash unreasonably. Well, I, I think this would translate as, we put money into it. Because I asked that directly. I said, look, does it really matter? And if you put money into it, clearly it's gone. <clears throat> no, 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 we do. We just want to know if there's any leak in our own personal ship here. And why ask me? Because I get around, I know a few Russians, all of that. Uh, <clears throat> as an outsider, um, you know, I often get um, people on my own little grubby channel sending me a message. Um, they, how do I get contacts? You know, it's not fair in this world. You know, there's... there's Everybody seems to know Escobar's except me. <laughs> and the uh, point is, um, you've got to do, if you, if you really want to know a place, it's best to live amongst them for a while. Um, you can imagine down where you, I mean, you're in Arizona, but um, if you went in over into Mexico, I bet you weren't one of those people who said, I'll run in and do this overnight. No, stay there a bit. Put the feet out. I put wild man and wild woman down there. Did they remember nothing that happened? <laughs> First house they got in, they just blew it up. Great. So living quiet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Complete opposite of <laughs> decorum. Mm. Uh, yeah. It, uh, I suppose that what is the lesson from that? Do everything yourself if you can. We yeah. had a shipment of 40,000 pills coming in. Mm. And a crack dealer ripped Wildman off for a ten dollar rock, and I told him to let it go. Oh, he wouldn't though, would he? A matter of principle, whatever. Battered him in front of the police. Oh, I right, don't why not. So he was already giving the police drugs, so it was okay. Oh, well, that's fair enough. Ecstasy and LSD. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't have thought that LSD is something that naturally goes with good policing, would you? What it is in Mexico, they're running the weed and the coke. So if you go down there with something that they're not familiar with, oh, they want to try you've it. got scarcity value. It's mm. unique. So we had ecstasy and LSD. To get the LSD into Mexico, we had like rave lights. Yeah. And these were gel tabs that were on sheets of plastic. Oh, okay. So they look like transparent. Just, just put colored, look like colored filters for the rave lights. It didn't melt or anything. Or no. you didn't well, the, the, lights. the lights weren't on, so yeah, they were just in transport. Yeah. Oh well, that's, that's got novelty. Um, I hope it wouldn't um, wrap your sandwich up in some of that plastic. <laughs> really it could munch into the end of it. Permafried. <laughs> Even a little strip from the end of the gel tab. My mm. friend asked Joey; he loved it. He would do loads, but he was found dead in his swimming pool at one point. So I was going to say. Um, Though they say an overdose of LSD doesn't kill you, uh, you've seen the way people behave. You'll, uh, you'll be permanently looking for Cox cable vans with double aerial antennas yeah, and dark, rewiring and dark in tinted there. windows for the rest of your life. <laughs> I, I think that because yeah. certainly from my own experience, it's only the first few tabs ever seem to work. You know, with the, the light show and everything. Um, and never after that, it was just sort of kind of dismally speedy. But uh, so it does seem to do a bit of rewiring. But anyway, um, I would, uh, there was a fee involved in, in all of this. So, um, and there was one other thing to do for my friend. He had um, a, a storage room. Uh, now, in London, 
A lot of people use uh, self-storage lockers, which come either room size or even like cabinet size. But in Scandinavia, there's not an awful lot of those, never has been. Um, and certainly in Denmark, I think there were only three. One you wouldn't use because some Nazi used to run it. Um, and, you know, he was always on at the police. And they, maybe that was the one to use because the police were so sick of him ringing. Ah, I've discovered something very unique here, you know. Um, and the one Emil used was a kind of newish one. Um, but it had a few features that were not to be liked. So I, I asked if there was anything important or damaging, and there was a kind of a ledger there that had to be removed. Um, it could have been explained away, but you'd rather not. Um, so um, how do you get into uh, somebody else's um, storage locker when you, it's not your locker, it's not your name, and they take a, um, a passport a photo of the thing when you get the place. So, of course, the, the name of the passport's never, never your own, but nonetheless, there's something resembling a photo there. Um, the only way to do it, now, Emil used what you do in these situations, combination lock, so I had, at least I had the number. Um, and I rented my own, um, fairly close to his <laughs> <laughs> because the guy showed me around and said where well, we've got this this empty oh, I, I kind of like that one but it's the same as the one no i kind of like that one <laughs> as i read that one then when it was more or less after hours went in there opened mine up fooled around could have been on camera but i it just wasn't busy enough that they They'd be interested. Got in there. What did he? What did Emil have? He had a, a pile of old junk, mostly. Some paintings that he liked to collect. A couple of antique bits of furniture. You know, um, I'm tapping the furniture. You know what I mean? Listening for that telltale thunk, as opposed <laughs> to the doing. I don't want any thunks because uh, I didn't really sign on for you know handling dangerous goods. Um, but I moved anything that uh, looked like he might want to keep, you know, some classic comic book editions and all that sort of thing into mine, extended the, um, the rent on that. Um, and um, so, so there was nothing that seemed to me of danger. Um, oh, yeah, there was one thing that I had to... Um, dig out there was um a camera with an sd card in it and so i took that because somebody mentioned something about pictures were taken uh and the rest of the comic books and the, the paintings i left in their cardboard boxes and, and put them in there so that that's that was out of the way looked on the sd card and there were some pictures of the the um Gudvana, the ship. Now, um, you know when you look at a, um, a picture on your laptop of a, a picture file, you've got all sorts of adjustment things that um, are right at your side. So I was kind of fiddling around with the saturation and the hue and everything to look at the background of this port where it was. It was some place like Pedro, it's near Kaliningrad. You know, that's that bit of Russia that sticks out into the, the Baltic season. Or not. Um, and what was odd about the, the picture of the ship was only that the paintwork was a bit fresh. So I thought, oh, it's just an artifact of how I'm viewing it on there. I can't see them bothering to you know, change the paintwork on it. But when I adjusted up the, um, really increased the saturation, where uh, uh, the name of the ship was, the K was overwritten on something. And I could only just make out A N T O something or other, jumble. So um, 
I went to, um, uh, I ended up uh, at about a week before I went, was going back to London, um, went to Moscow, uh, met a couple of my oh, old pals, I guess they were old pals, I mean they were from the uh, Pakistan area, uh, era, uh, and had been sent back to uh, Russia initially to prisons. Now, these were the bunch of guys I told you about who'd um, broken out of a Russian prison, hijacked a plane, taken the plane to uh, Pakistan because it was run by General Zia al-Haq in those days who hated the Americans and the, the Russians at the same time, thought they'd be safe in doing so. And they were not... This sounds like they're going to be really sophisticated guys, but they weren't. They just knew plane gets in the air and get out of town. Um, so they'd spent about 10 years there in, in fairly ruthless circumstances. I'm surprised they're still alive at this point of the story. Um, well... Didn't they get, like, the bones broken and tortured at one point? Uh, oh, in, in, in Pakistan, yeah. Uh, not really bones broken, but they certainly got uh, beaten a lot uh, and they ended up sewing their lips together to avoid the force feeding from hunger strikes and all of that. Um, but these guys are still going. Uh, well, um, I Maybe was limping keeping, a bit and stuff. <laughs> keeping track of them through um, uh, Tatiana, the, the the girl who was um, not just translator, but she was over in the Pakistan prison as well. She'd been sent by a Nigerian boyfriend that she'd met in Moscow or down in Krasnodar. Oh, flashbacks now. What was the name of the Russian, the boss? Andreas. Andreas. Mm. I was going to say Andre, Andreas. Yeah, he was he was really the, the tapest of the bunch. But anyway, um, one of them um, had uh, some connections with, um, he, he knew where to find them anyway, the, the, the ones who worked out of the, of the Black Sea and all around there smuggling cigarettes about. <clears throat> <clears throat> and it was true enough the, uh, that this boat had a history as the Antonis before it was a Gabbana. And so the reason that it was um, explained away to the, the Danish packers, and there was one English Pakistani guy involved in this as a bargain, um, was that it was red hot as the Antonis. It had been busted taking uh, cigarettes about a couple of times, and seized, then stolen out of where it was seized from, um, and hence the phony name change. But Basha, uh, whom I contacted in uh, Dubai, had a look at the registry and said that the um, uh, the fees hadn't been paid lately or ever, um, and um, it's still owed for some refueling or something. So really every flagging, attention-making thing possible had been connected with this boat. Mm -hmm. Plus um, the Latvian guys had a pretty cavalier attitude to how they used the telephones. Um, so it wasn't matter, really a matter of um, who, um, where the leak was or what. It was a matter of which agency um, you, you're trying to keep out of it. That boat um, got loaded up um, seemingly with a, everybody's knowledge down in Quetta. Now, the thing about those little port towns, <clears throat> if you're going to pay anybody off to do anything, it you pay small, last minute, and local. You don't go in there. I mean, this is so obvious, but you don't go in there a month early and say, well, gosh, I'm going to get myself some hashish. <laughs> and, you know, uh, it's only whatever you're calling the stuff, I don't know, oil, um, sand, <laughs> exporting some sand. It doesn't matter. The only person that you're slinging a bit of money is the, um, uh, the port inspector on the day. And, and the, um, if there is one, 
uh, a port's pilot, you know, the guys who go out with the, the tugs if they they have to lead them into the dock, which doesn't really happen to well there. <clears throat> so it not only doesn't cost you that much, it because it's last minute before you're leaving, there's um, there's none of those loose lips that do know exactly what, um, <clears throat> particularly. But they, um, I. But here's another thing, children out there, worth knowing. If we've got <clears throat> crooked Russians and their cigarettes involved, Latvians who are careless, uh, uh, a British Pakistani who says he's arranged this and arranged that and paid for this and that, Almost none of the people involved have paid what they should have paid for the services or the ship or the goods or anything. They've trousered um, at least half, if not more, of the money, told a story about the rest. Uh, and not only that, um, enough um, noise about outsiders and foreigners and whatnot had been made down in the port that... Um, what would you call them? Their signalers, their land-based pickets, um, the stringers who feed information back to the um, American Navy intelligence people. I don't think they even know who they're feeding it to. It doesn't really matter. They get a, a little drink out of it. Everybody, um, <clears throat> every agency worth anything was all over it. At first, the Americans thought that, uh, is this some... Um, Ex explosives laden ship heading towards the Gulf you know, to, to ram them. And <clears throat> it was not long after the USS Cole had been um, steamed into by some, uh, were they Zodiacs? I know they were small craft anyway, uh, loaded with explosives in a kind of kamikaze by boat um, operation. They were kamikazes by boat, weren't they? Submarine uh, riders uh, in the Japanese Navy who guided them. I mean, they were supposed to get off in the last 10 feet. Well, what difference does that make? <laughs> Not much. <clears throat> um, so uh, it was not really... Uh, oh, and the thing, <clears throat> when, it, when the boat got... They let it get as far as uh, go through Dubai and then pass into the Mediterranean and up. But by the time it came out of the Mediterranean, it was a matter of drawing straws as to which agencies were going to get it. And the ones who <clears throat> put in a bit of work, I think the French were in, but they got out, the British didn't care. They only had one of their nationals to concern them with, they could arrest him any old time. So um, the Danes, um, well, you could say all of Scandinavia won because the, the Swedes um, got involved as well. <clears throat> they intercepted it there, um, and then all the players were very sad. <clears throat> Nobody was arrested. Um, no one was arrested immediately, um, apart from the crew, of course, who didn't know anything, um, mostly Pakistanis, actually. Uh, boat seized, put up into um, uh, available for viewing for those who cared one way or another. Um, but there was no further to take it. Um, and I don't know, do you ever get the feeling like um, you thought, this is good, where have I been? I've enjoyed my little time in Christiania, my time in Denmark. I've had a couple of meetings. Um, Florence, who was, uh, she was now my kind of um, go-between for information. I wasn't going to go back into Christiania uh, any more than I had to. Um, if you're kind of regularly going in there and staying at hotels, it's no good. Um, I'd uh, met her a couple of times and didn't have any sense that there was anything around me. Um, a good spot was um, what's uh, it's a very old national theatre in in a big square in uh, Copenhagen. Um, it means anybody who's following you has got to walk over a big open pathway. Um, but, I mean, I always knew that it was a somewhat risky thing there because if you get, I didn't want to get drawn into that case, even though that case was over. So um, I said to Florence, look, 
they said, oh, you've got a bit of a fee, just come into Christianity and pick it up. Leave it for Emil when he gets out of all this, he'll need it more than I do. Mostly, I, I just didn't want to go back in there. And um, I gave them the details about, oh yeah, I had one more thing to do. <laughs> one more thing to do, yeah. Um, um, I'm getting a look at, yes, no, I'd finished with her, <clears throat> left, uh, went back to London to um, um, get another place. I, I just, the Sloan Avenue one wasn't so good. You know, I was going to the um, Iranian expats for, they've got a lot of property down that way. After the Shah of um, uh, Persia was chased out, and Khomeini came in, a lot of um, wealthy Iranians ended up in London. And they bought a lot of properties down in Edgware Road and they sucked away a bit of money. But <clears throat> they'd always maintained a kind of quiet existence. So if you knew a couple of the estate agents uh, amongst the Iranians, um, and they sort of knew you, you could go there and... I need this kind of apartment. There wouldn't be an awful lot of fuss. I mean, you're paying 12 months in advance anyway. So uh, what's to lose? Um, they they, they didn't, didn't even ask for references, really. And then you mumble them anyway. Yeah, I remember I rented off you before. Sure you did. Yeah, I bet you did. Um, and at the time, uh, Jeanette was back from over there, but, and I was... And tying a knot in the thing with Eloise because I, I just, you know, I'd, I'd always been a little bit unlucky if people had, um, if I got tied down to earthly things, then and commitments to people, it would all blow up. Something would happen, guaranteed to take it. What does it mean? Was it? Do you think we take our eye off the bull when? Uh, We've got a, a hat in the ring, a personal interest, a, a girlfriend to save or a relationship to nurture. Maybe. But I think <clears throat> as far as the, the fates are concerned, um, when you've got nothing to lose and don't care, you're protected. The moment you've got something valuable in your life, even if it's just um, parental, you know, you, 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 know, you last said to your mum and dad, no, I'll be back in time for Christmas. Yeah, just shot yourself in the foot, haven't you? Christmas, what year? <laughs> uh, uh. Now, um, but I was getting, now this is, uh, I've been over 30 something years in the trade, man and boy, uh, and I'm taking quite a bit of precautions here. Um, in the lockers I just opened up, um, if there was anything wrong, I figured I'd want to know in advance. So um, in one of the, um, I just wanted to know if somebody was snooping about because I had to go back there um, to pick up a, a little bit of um, Swedish kroner and Danish money that was there. I'd put in, um, I think you probably buy such a thing now, but anyway, this was homemade out of, uh, uh, some parts from Tottenham Court Road. They've got some electronic shops you can get most things. What it was was simply a passive infrared sensor for the locker, or it's like a little room. Uh, when that's triggered, closes the circuit, it switches on the auto dialer. The auto dialer makes a telephone call through to a pager in um, the UK. Um, and the pager just goes off. Um, and I looked at the thing, it's still working. It was from a company called Parrot. Um, they had these pages. And they're really, now you'd think, wouldn't you? Who would want a pager these days? Yeah, phones everywhere. They do everything you want. You want a message? Fine. You want it to go off at a particular time? Fine. Auto dial? Fine. All of that. A simple pager that just accepts any incoming call to its number, it will notify you. Who would want such a thing? Well, ask the customers on eBay who shell out 500 pounds for any of those because they've maintained the network. 
because the how do they pay for themselves? You've got no contract, no nothing. But to call any of the pager numbers, it's like 75p uh, per minute. So it's very expensive. That's how they uh, make it on the surcharge calling fees, even though these pages were sold years and years ago. Wow. I know. I thought old pages were obsolete these days. No, there's a, among we're... the cognoscenti of spookery, they have, um, to have a telephone number that can be called by anybody and then have that trigger a, a remote device. You know why it sails above? Sure, you can get a, a, a cell phone to do all of the same things. But what does a pager not have that a mobile does? Mobile has IMEI number. You know, it has an identifying computer in there. Any mobile phone is effectively um, like using a computer from somewhere. Whereas these old pages, it's a radio signal. It just goes out, beamed across the country from some lonely, dusty, cobwebbed you, transmitters. You're bringing back all of our pager codes now. Mm. So if there was an eight eight, someone wanted an eight ball of something. Right. Or six six six. six, 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 six. <laughs> there's a problem. There's yeah. a problem. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, six 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 too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't need any explanation. <laughs> a room full of people hearing a pager go off and looking at the screen and seeing triple sixes would all scatter like startled gazelles <laughs> on the African Serengeti plain. Out on the streets <laughs> looking for Cox cable. With tinted windows. <clears throat> so I left on a Saturday morning to head back for a quick trip to uh, Copenhagen. She be back by evening. And um, left the flat in Sloan Square, closed the door, went downstairs. About the time I stepped into the black taxi, if you'd have been a ghost sitting in my small Sloan Square apartment living room, sitting there, listening to the breeze blow, you would have seen on a ledge where there was a large kind of fake ashtray that held keys and bits and pieces. Next to it, there was a little pocket pager come to life, vibrating, vibrating. And I'm told later on it was found on the carpet because it, it was so enthusiastic Jumped about off. <laughs> wanting me to know about something important. It had hit the carpet. Hmm. I mean, that was the thing. You couldn't get a live feed from this pager unless it was on you. But I couldn't take it out of the country. It would only work in the UK. It wasn't that slick. I don't know whether there ever was an international pocket pager, maybe. But I doubt it, because it needs a transmitter in, in country. So I went about my lawful business in Denmark for the day uh, and called in at the... Now, there is no, I swear, there, as far as I know, there are no drugs in this uh, storage place. Not Emil's, not mine, there's a bit of money, there's this stupid comic book collection, I've got rid of the tick sheet, the SD card's gone, the picture's gone. You've on the furniture. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, and I've left that back in his original one. I didn't take that with me into my new one. I don't know what's been done to that wood. Hope you're enjoying this podcast. There's a word from our sponsor, Rocket Money. The other day, I had to cancel free Amazon Prime memberships. I had a personal on the UK, Amazon, US, Amazon, company account, US, Amazon, UK, Amazon. Do you understand how hard it is to cancel these bloody things? That's why Rocket Money makes these things so much easier, formerly known as Truebill. The app shows all your subscriptions in one place and cancels what you don't want for you. Rocket Money can even find subscriptions you didn't know you were paying for. Just like with me, with my four Amazon Prime memberships, you may find out you've been at least double charged for a subscription. To cancel a subscription, all you've got to do is press cancel and Rocket Money takes care of the rest. Get rid of useless subscriptions with Rocket Money now. Go to rocketmoney.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. Seriously, it could save you hundreds per year. That's rocketmoney.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. Thank you for supporting our sponsor, Rocket Money. Links in the description box. Cheers. Yeah, I just, but, you know, like, these were valuable comic 
books. They they wouldn't have been dipped in something, you know, LSD or whatever. So, um, but what put me a little bit off was um, I, I got out of the taxi and I was going on to the airport. Uh, I told the taxi to wait. Um, I don't know, something, 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 something said, get back in that taxi, get back in that taxi, get back in <laughs> Opened up the uh, main door to, it's like a tin warehousey thing, you know, like a, um, you can imagine it a kind of prefab, but it's not, it's those kind of factories they have out at the airport. Uh, stepped in, um, and there was a carpenter there, soaring away. I mean, I know the place was new, and I knew they were doing extensions. You know, I knew all about the place. I don't like any damn carpenter at 4.45 in the afternoon on a Friday. No, was it Saturday? Anyway, I didn't like it. And he didn't want to look at me. And why didn't he want to look at me? I'm good looking enough. Even if I'm ugly, I'm freakish enough. I want to be looked at by a carpenter. <laughs> he was busy soaring. You know, looked up briefly, but went back to his work like a... Okay, that's bad enough. So, so what do I do now, Sean? I speed back to the taxi. No, no sudden moves, do I? Uh, walked around a bit. Gosh, I seem to be lost today. Where, oh, where is my little locker room? <laughs> uh, man, woman, couple around the corner. They've got a locker door open. Yeah. Oh no, they weren't there. They were five minutes, ten minutes later. I went to the snake who runs the place on some pretext of buying some extra cardboard boxes which they sold for, I don't know, 50 kroner a packet. Oh, yeah, how are you? Good, good, good. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, just arrived in town. I'm reversing everything. Don't know why. I'm just trying to throw out a reverse story to see, <laughs> you know, whether he's going. That's not right. They told me you were just leaving. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but he's a bit nervous. Yeah. He says, "Okay, very good. I guess you're off to your room now." Yeah, I don't think I am. Not quite. <laughs> I think I might have left something in the taxi out there. Oh, definitely, I do. Sell me a couple of those fine boxes of yours. Or oh, you can have them. <laughs> oh, you want your 50 kroner? No change today, keep them. <laughs> okay, you're a pal. So I, I backed around the other side, and now there's a man and a woman talking too loudly, uh, too loudly at the door of another thing open. So I make it my business to pass by with a courteous nod. Yeah, they've got the door open. There's nothing in there. And they've realized that by the time they get there, I'll look in and realize there's nothing there. So they create another fatal mistake by saying what to each other? She says to him, uh, well, of course, none of my things are here just yet, but I'll be bringing them over. I really felt like turning to her and saying, if you'd said it in Danish, I might have swallowed it. <laughs> so how am I going to get out? I don't know what's getting me, but I don't want to have to answer this question to the uh, Danish plot. And the carpenter's got a fucking carpenter's assistant by the time I get back in there, sort of bronzing up just about, getting ready for a fight. Um... So I'm at the doorway and talking to the taxi driver who's half asleep down there. Can't hear a word I'm saying. Now bring them in here. But I kind of... Do I have to... Oh, I'll give you a hand there. I don't get out the door. <laughs> They're all over me like a rash. Oh. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm thinking? <laughs> I'm thinking, I don't know what's going on exactly. But no doubt in time I'll find out. I just thought... There's two more apartments gone. There's the fresh batch of documents gone. There's, what have I got in my bag here? 33,000. No, that's gone. Um, gone, gone, gone. <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and you know what they, uh, by the time, them, I was kind of tired by then, because you know, you're not going anywhere, nothing's happening. And I'm sorry, I can't be bothered talking to them. Normally, out of politeness to arresting officers, I'll, you know, 
say hello, how you doing, have a nice surveillance. I hope it wasn't too boring for you and all of that. No, I just can't be bothered. And at least they're not speaking English to me anymore. They're talking amongst themselves and saying, oh, yeah, we've got to write gangster here. He's not saying a word. I didn't even have the energy to say I'm not saying a word because I'm some gangster. I just passed caring. Give me a cosy cell. Um, I mean, the, the passport's all over the place. I'm not going anywhere. Uh, anyway, they don't know about bail over there. You don't get none of that. It, you... There is such a thing after three months, uh, and three months in isolation, because as I mentioned, the top of the hour, the top of the program, I didn't put anybody off who, uh, get, until your case is over with, that's, that's all you held. But I'll cut to the chase here a little bit, and um, found out that my lawyer eventually got in, uh, Henrik, Henrik, oh yeah. I'll think of a second name. A good one is, I think he's still in the game after all these years. Hello, Henrik. Hope you watched this. Get yeah. in touch. <laughs> yeah, Henrik. He's your man if you're ever over there. Look for Henrik. You should read this, Henrik. I recommend it. He's not actually, he might be mentioned in there. Unforgiving Destiny. Mm. Um, but, so he's allowed to see me. He can't give me the court papers. I'm not allowed to have them. That's how spooky it is, yeah. Remember, bear in mind, the, the prison you go to where they have all this isolation stuff is the very old-fashioned prison. And you can tell what their attitude was because if you try and break up the monotony by going to church on Sunday, they have individual, sorry, microphone, individual pews where you can't talk to the prisoner next to you. And that was because... In their old days, prisoners did their time alone. You never mixed. Say you got to, you never mixed with another prisoner. They thought if you mixed with other criminals, you'd only fatten your address book and come out worse. Well, it's never happened, has it, John? No. Never happened. And church has never been used to pass contraband and to get <laughs> drama and gossip from the other areas of the prison. <laughs> mm. So I eventually find out. Um, that I'm charged with um, some cocaine uh, that was in Emil's stuff. Where was it? In furniture. That you no, no, I can't get nicked with that. It's still in his. I was duly suspicious. Mind you, I wouldn't put it past the Dane. Uh, they did ask about it. The cardboard boxes that um, he had all his comic books in. The value wasn't the, well, might have been the rare comic book first editions, but the boxes. I wondered why they were waxed. You know those ones you get and they're kind of, kind of waxy outside? And you think, oh, yeah, it's because in case it's for fruit and in case it leaks and all of that. Couldn't he have communicated this to you? Well, it would have been nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he probably was obeying the rule that I should have been obeying with others and not tell them where the stash is because all they do is party all night with it. <laughs> Uh, spend your money and, and sell your passports to somebody else. I mean, the amount of times I've had people say, oh, I, I didn't see any passports that day. No, well, they, they were missing, especially the German one and the Irish one. Well, the Irish one you never saw because it was missing. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, one, am I going to plead not guilty? I don't know what to plead guilty to. Um, so Henrik says, uh, um, you, you might as well because you're going to be found guilty anyway uh, and you get a little, no, not much of the sentence and it won't be much anyway, like it's six months or something like that. I will say that um, if, if, you're, um, if you're looking for a prison to get in prison in, uh, and you absolutely have to do it. You could do worse uh, than a Danish prison. It was... Um, I, I, I did have to one of, have one of those policemen's visits with a, a friend who came in. Um, I can't remember what his uh, code name is. Uh, oh, okay, he's dead. I can call him Mark. Mm. You know what he died from? Carelessness. I call it a sport, sporting accident. Yeah, uh, drugs he didn't check out, uh, took a skinful, had a drink on top of it, handful of pills, 
He and his girlfriend were found dead, naked, in a hotel room in um, uh, Aarhus in uh, Sweden. Both of them were dead. Both of them, yeah. That's how. And I, I knew what that stuff was. Uh, it had been laced with, uh, what's mean green called? Is it chlorpromazine? You know that mm. stuff that uh, used to be called the liquid kosh that they'd given nut houses? I'm not, sure, I'm not really sure what's in that. Massively powerful tranquilizer. Like, yeah. Uh, it had been put in there to make it seem stronger, and, and they told me, huh, the creeps who did it, um, that it wasn't meant to go that way. It was for the African market or something like that. Oh, well. Yeah, um, and it was African selling in the, in the African market. So I don't know how many they lost. Maybe they're sterner stuff. I don't know. But anyway, Marky Mark and girlfriend. Uh, his wife wasn't too happy when she got the news. <laughs> your husband's been found. Ah, uh, dead and naked. Oh, tragedy. In the saddle. Propped up on the headboard with the TV remote in hand. Yeah, it must be a strong stuff. Yeah. Um, what were the pills? They were... Uh, one thing, none of these things would actually kill you outright. But, you know, you can't have 45 beers and, and um, Valium and you know, uh, smoke a couple of lines of brown and a sniff of Charlie. I mean, you can't do all that at the same day. You know, Attempting yeah. the Grim Reaper, though. Mm. Um, oh, and have the liquid kosh liberally sprinkled over everything. You can see it. You can smell it. It's green tinge. Beware. Uh, and anything, I think, isn't it? Green tinged people. Keep away from them. Green genitals. Don't want to have anything to do with that. <laughs> no. Is, is that a symptom of monkey pox? Green genitalia? I don't know. It doesn't look good. So, um, anyway, uh, I will... Let's not dwell in prison any longer than necessary. Kind of all right. I, I, I almost, I sort of went into overdrive in the, in the, and they didn't bother. I mean, the, the regulars there. There's two banditos and hell's angels among the biker groups in Denmark and they're fiercely competitive. But they're, they're very nice guys and certainly uh, fine in, in the Danish prison. But they tend to be in the, closed prison because they're, they're tagged as um, um, sometimes kill each other. They've been having wars recently. Haven't yeah, they? No, they've been military they were warring back, uh, back then. Um, a friend of mine who was involved in it, so he joined up and he was a probationer and had to shoot somebody in the head. Got and, rocket uh, frog grenade launchers and attacks mm. and everything. There. No, they take it kind of serious. Odd thing is, it's, it's a small country, what, six million people. They, and you get that with smaller places, when they adopt something that seems to have a, um, a code and a uniform and, and, a, and you know, a way of doing things, they do it a bit more serious than, say, the American Hells Angels would be kind of a bit relaxed and, you know, well, in their own way. R.I.P. Sonny Barger? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That goes back, doesn't it? God. Um, mind you, people take speed as a drug are likely to be a bit stressed out, aren't they? <laughs> Yeah, gutter drugs as we used to call them. Anyway, um, I had within a few months um, uh, an office in the place of my employer, which was in the electrical warehouse within the prison. Uh, nice, comfy office chair, a little laptop. Um, we'd built with a South African um, guy that I'd met in there, uh, Africana. Uh, he um, he's too. Um, he, he didn't really know me, but he he, he came to know me, and um, I think I, I predicted the uh, a couple of things to his satisfaction, which came to be true. So um, he was handy to have around, but uh, but we were alone in there. Um, so what it was fifty five. Uh, channels of cable, big kitchen where you did your meals, down in the supermarket, within the prison, once a week, you're paid around a, what would it be, the equivalent of $150 a week, $200 a week for whatever phony job you've got. So you can do your shopping, buy your raw ingredients, use the kitchen. They don't want you to be 
a complete um, outcast to society by the time they throw you back out there. You've got to know how to run a little household and do your shopping and all of that. Um, I, why is it not done here? Because their recidivism rate is, is quite low. They don't have people coming back all the time, except, you know, dedicated crooks. Um, and, and there is a reason too. They have, um, you can remember there was an old law in the UK, I think it's gone now, consorting with known criminals. If you, it was like points on a driving license. If you had, I think, three or four convictions for that, and this known criminal might be your cousin, or in some cases your wife, you know. Um, then you got six months in jail for it. But there... These it's are like, criminals that have been previously prosecuted and released. Yeah. You're not allowed to consult you're with them not, after they're released. You're, um, if you've got a record, you're not... One of the um, terms of your release is that you're not to consult with known gotcha. criminals. Uh, and I think it's so broad that anybody can be convicted of being consorting with known criminals. So, um, Especially if someone didn't declare they were a known criminal. And it's worse. There's a thing of um, if you get reported for being involved in incidents unspecified uh, more than a certain amount of time uh, off to jail you go. So, um, yeah, the prisons are good and they don't... Um, they don't have the problems within them. They've got a prisoner's union. Some of your uh, weekly wage goes into paying um, a little fund within the prisoner's union so that when you go on strike, yes, you can. If uh, your union leader who's elected decides that this is intolerable, the quality of the movies on the in-house video is not to be you know, put up with any longer and you all go out on strike, um, you get paid from the strike fund. Wow. I mean, can you imagine in a British prison them allowing them to have elected officials within the prisoner group, having their own accounts to wage a campaign against the authority? Uh, we don't even have the right to vote here, do we? No, no, that was argued over pointlessly. And I <clears throat> never understood that one because um, you'd think anyway, who cares? Yeah. and But secondly... Um, if you are imprisoned by a law that you don't agree with, surely you would, should have the right to uh, elect the representation that represents you and your view that that shouldn't be against the law anyway, if you know what I mean. I was on Channel 4, was it? I was on one of the news stations about right to I vote. I think I remember something. Yeah, and I said social inclusion, but the, there was a poll running at the bottom. Like right. 90 plus percent of the public were, don't give them the right to vote. Ah, yeah. right. Yeah, I know, isn't it trivial? Uh, as if voting, even the, we or anybody, the voting population have got no control over who gets in anyway. Um, it's an illusion of choice, how it's in. Mm, um, and, I mean, at the moment we've even got this idiotic contest for uh, who will be prime minister being voted on by the populace? No. Um, by a little accidental club of um, a Tory party members. So, and what's it, 130,000 odd people or something? And they're sitting around as though it means anything. You've got this guy in America who's shaking hands with people who aren't there. Uh, yeah, He's I got his that. little cheat yeah. sheet. This is President Biden we're referring <laughs> to people. He, uh, they don't like him going off script, do they? Luckily to say anything. Who's really in control? Think about that. <laughs> yeah. we, you, we must get off this subject. It's yeah, going to get some no, trouble. We'll come back to <laughs> some burning time at the end of this thing. So, um, okay. Uh, as wonderful as it is there and somehow relaxed, I somehow managed to screw it up because um, one of my guys, uh, the couriers, who's um, still kicking around, has. Um, Not the Liverpudlian. No, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I'd give him a job, all right, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's called Novichok, you rub it on your face and you walk right through, <laughs> uh, yeah, he, uh, I, don't know, I think he might have passed on, oh yeah, Les, yeah, cutie, <laughs> um, no, this was, we'll call him the lollipop man, because if you were, um, if it was, 
end of the school day for the kids, you'd see a guy standing there at the pedestrian crossing, that's a zebra crossing across the pond, um, with a stick in his hand saying stop. And that's about as much authority as that guy ever gets in his entire <laughs> life. But he's got the beaming face of an innocent uh, and it's safe around children and you can't get that combination without asking for trouble. <laughs> so uh, he was... Now, nobody will ever believe me about this, but I only wanted to um, get him out of... Oh, I know he was in real trouble. Yeah, I'd forgotten. I had a memory that he was just looking for work. No, I had to do something. I don't know whether it was a good idea. I was getting the message from some slim dude's mobile phone passed on to mine inside the Danish prison. They really don't like you to have these phones, but um, you can as long as you hide them. Um, that the lollipop man was in the Bangkok uh, Immigration Detention Center. He's got some outstanding fine, he can't get out. Yeah, something about a hotel room, not paid for, stolen TV. I don't know what, something, doesn't matter. But he's, he was really my best guy. You could, if, um, if the lollipop man was seen strolling down from the grassy knoll with a man like a Garkino rifle slung over his shoulder, <laughs> the police would stop him and say, didn't see the killer go by, did you? <laughs> he could not get arrested. <laughs> so I thought. Anyway, he certainly got himself arrested over, you know, the some jaded trick in the hotel and turned on payment. So I rang up a friend of mine, um, who was the uh, kind of Emil's generation. I said, "Look, uh, I heard your." Uh, uh, you're heading over to, um, is it Phuket? Yeah, uh, in Thailand. You could do me a favor and get my man out of trouble there. Man? Eh? Well, I suppose he could work for you. Look, I don't want to get him screwed up into anything. The really dangerous stuff, I'll do with him. You can't let him run around with anything that's more than a bit of puff or something. You know, nothing with huge consequences, because I've given him a golden ticket. Anytime he gets busted, I get him out. That's the deal. And, you know, if it's something stronger or more or too much, you know, you've got to put a bit of work into getting people out. I prefer it, you know, Sean, when they say, because there's an option, you know, the court and see what you can do and pay off a bit, let's nobble the trial. Deal with that. Break me out. I want to escape. Good fellow, I say. Oh, thank Christ for that. I only wish that... Uh, What's his name? Um, Carlos Goen, you know, the Mitsubishi chief, had got onto me instead of uh, some broken down ex American Marine that uh, got him sprung out of. Uh, he was wanted to, he was in Japan and he escaped from there by hiding himself in um, huge speaker boxes and going, taking the speed train up to Osaka and flying out. Where did he go? Uh, he got on a private jet. I mean, he was caked, and his wife was paying the tab on this one, so you can imagine. <laughs> we could have been made, Sean. Think of what we could have done for the guy. I mean... Oh. Did he stay out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know that kind of money. Anyway, he's got three passports. French, good to have any time. Lebanese, worth his weight in gold, if you're there. Worth shit, if you're not. Uh, and d d d I forget what the other one is. Brazilian, yeah. Um... Anyway, so it was a private jet, took him out from Osaka. Um, and I think it stopped in Istanbul, or Ankara, yeah. Uh, refueled and went on to Beirut. I even went on television and said, look, you know, uh, yeah, I had to, I was getting railroaded in Japan, and it's true, 99% conviction rate there. But there is a, you know, a trail of uh, people in jail behind all of this. The pilot got two years and because wor he worked for a Turkish airline and, well, nobody was exactly keeping it quiet. But in this case, going back to the lollipop man, uh, I didn't want such an operation to have to be mounted in his case. So I said, look, if he wants the work, okay, do it. Um, but... Yeah. 
um, as I say, uh, no level, something we're not looking at more than 12 months max. Yeah, 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 fine, done. Is an echo on this phone? <laughs> um, because, oh, yes, the, the, the other thing that um, I found in my search of all Emil's papers was this guy's number. And now that um, I couldn't be absolutely sure that they hadn't already got into that locker of his, because I know um, something that sparked the DEA's involvement. I mean, they were involved anyway. They were always involved. But the um, the fake passport I'd used to rent the locker in the warehouse in Denmark had a photo on it that was in black and white, but it was sent on to Washington. And even though I adjusted the picture so that all the, um, the color tones, if rendered in black and white, would have the same intensity. So when it, if it gets faxed through or, or not kept in color, you can hardly see it. You'd have trouble staring at this picture and identifying it. In fact, your brother might be able to. Or Bill Shankman might be able to, which he did. Oh. <laughs> anyway, that trouble is yet to come. Um, <laughs> where am I? Uh, oh, yeah, I'm on the phone, unwisely, finding work for the lollipop man, who foolishly has got himself in the Bangkok detention center uh, with something to pay before he can get out. And um, another Danish colleague happens to be in uh, Phuket, and will be, is going to get him out of trouble and take him to Spain, so I believe. And there's more I know that about it, but I don't want to know about it because I say to him on the phone, I said, listen, yeah, yeah, that number. You got my message about that number, didn't you? Oh, yeah, yeah, thanks for that. Are you sure? I said, look, you don't get a message from me unless I'm sure or sure enough, so you've got to act on it. And you did act on it, didn't you? Yes. What does that timid yes mean? Well, I got rid of it. And there's no link between that number and the one I'm calling you now on, is there? That couldn't possibly be happening, could it? No rank amateur would that. Pause, click. That's me hanging up. <sighs> Thinking, uh, oh. yeah, what are the odds? What are the odds? What are the odds? So I get another phone, I get it to somebody else. They're all right? Yeah, they're all in Spain. Nobody arrested? No. Okay, I'm not going to call anymore. Yeah, that's enough. Um, do, 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 having a good time. My little office downstairs. I've got my stuff in the uh, tumble dryer. Oh, yeah, we managed to get a tumble dryer from somewhere. Couldn't, oh, and I'm cooking for my visitors. Yeah, <laughs> got a big kitchen. I've got a roast chicken on the go, bringing in the tray, guards <laughs> opening the door for me, bedding, conjugal room, a whole bit. You know, kids are sent off into town to do whatever they do with money. Um, and uh, get back, think, oh, I haven't got long now, a couple of months, I guess. What am I going to do when I get out of this? Hmm. There's the thing about Australian newspapers, Sean. A Australian newspaper, you have a choice, and it's usually a local newspaper. All your news from newspapers should be local news. Children, listen, don't bother going online and getting like the overview from the BBC or the, even the New York Times. What you want is l the Bumsfield Hunter Shopper, or whatever it might be called. Because there you get the little stories. You know, a Croydon man picks his nose, or um, I don't know, Huddersfield woman, woman um, Sue's boyfriend. Within all of that, uh, the nose picker and the, the boyfriend, you're going to find out stuff, and the stuff will be relevant. And in this obscure, how oh, was it Spanish? I don't know, some foreign paper, a little one, the local news. Somebody had it. It's a story about some guy being arrested driving around with uh, a whole lot of Moroccan hash in the wheel rims of a car. 
something about the car breaking down, and a lot of other stuff you don't believe. But uh, and there's a Danish connection to it. That that was the part that I mean, lots of people could be arrested in Spain. But Danish connections. Anyway, I don't know anymore. I'm not calling anybody. No, no, no. Keeping off the phone. I'm just strolling around, minding my own business, uh, and. How do I know the dates so well of this? This was... Don't tell um, us Bill shows up. Well, I do because things take a turn, in general speaking, for the world and everything. I had this strange, wavy feeling that week. Um, but it was like something not necessarily bad, but being carried on waves. And then I went upstairs, and there was news in the living room, and some guy had crashed a light plane into a skyscraper in New York. You know, what was he doing flying around at that level in New York City? Then it wasn't a light plane. Then the second one happened, Twin Towers. I love it. Uh, uh, and that kind of occupied our attention for a bit. Um, but... Because of this thing in Spain, it's kind of gone away, but has it? I don't know. I'm thinking it through. You do when you've got time on your hands. If the phone was tapped, if this was that, if that was the other, could they, which is me, somehow being involved? I mean, the Danes could do anything. Um, so if, if I, you don't get called up for things there. You know, um, if you've got hiccups, how you cure somebody with hiccups? You give them a scare, right? A scare. A scare, yeah. Just say something scary. You, you know, is your wife on the phone or something? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what we when we were in the big house, if somebody had the hiccups, you know what all we'd have to say to them? Uh, oh, Sean, th um, didn't you hear of the loudspeaker? You've been called up. The front office wants you. That's enough. You know, you're shitting yourself because it's never good, and you don't want to know. And all of that. So when I'm, I was out in the looking at the same wall that the Hell's Angels broke down in Bristol's little prison some years before. They had a little break out there, and they patched it up quite well. When I hear uh, one of the guards is out there wandering around, and she's on the radio. Oh, they, could could you go in? Um, somebody wants to speak to you. I said, Miss, nobody wants to speak to me. Now I, I'm somebody that doesn't get spoken to. There's nothing, no information, no, nothing. I really don't want to go in there. And um, so I walk in there and I'm fucked. Um, Danish police are there and you don't pass go, don't collect your to it, nothing. Just, you, you invisible. <clears throat> so, uh, I won't go into all of that. It's depressing. But I end up... It's um, all of what? Oh, the, the, they charged me with being involved in the hashish run from um, from there. On the boat? No, not the boat. The, um, the stuff that the lollipop man had in his mm. car that he was sent by my other friend down there. Okay. But in the most rare example of, of rare win in that one, I say to Henrik... Look, I've had enough of all this. I don't want to play anymore. I didn't do anything. Yeah, but I don't care because, you know, you, you can be guilty after the fact or before or, or in outer space or another planet or, you know, in an alternate universe. This is Dane law. <laughs> um, but I actually managed to get out of it. But um, the they did disappear me, I mean, I have a sort of fondness for this thing, some tiny prison uh, up country somewhere. So for the last couple of months, um, I was there. Um, and and that's where I met two or three people that had been um, also disappeared off because they were, they, they were trouble. The Syrian guy was there because... Um, he knew all these people and had contacts around the world. A Danish villain was there because he was too big and never got caught for anything, so they imprisoned him. <laughs> uh, 
And this is perfect. I said, uh, you know, we went down there. There was a couple of Polish guys working in the dungeon, pressing out shirts or something, making all the money they could and sending it back home. There was a few other local village idiots. There wasn't even a kitchen. There was a, a guy came around from the local takeaway shop and used to give him some money to go and bring you a burger or something. <laughs> oh, damn fine burgers too. Kind of like a... The, the better part of a, a Burger King, you know, substantial sort of thing, um, with a, a toastiness of a kebab shop burger. I mean, <laughs> pr as prison burgers go, you know, this was top end burger. It's funny, I don't remember the food, even when it's rotten. What are those noodles called? Ramen noodles? <laughs> prison currency and everything. Something you'll never forget to your dying day, will it be, Sean? Yes. Anyway, um, here's the thing. We um, we came out to, I think, we didn't always mix. And we were, there was no real exercise there. Uh, there was no yard as such. But um, there, were, you, there was a couple of things. I think there was Easter and, and it had come along. So we had a kind of... They allowed us to order duck and have things and a lot of hideous traditional food. But me, uh, a Syrian, and the Danish guy took one look at each other. Hi, hi, hi. <laughs> and that was it. We knew straight away we were worth knowing. <laughs> 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 right away. And I mean, there was a sort of politeness around it. I mean, it was a peculiar setting, wasn't it? We've got Christmas, <laughs> last year's Christmas decorations on the Easter table and uh, this roast duck and a plum sauce and whatnot. And you, you're, um, you've kind of, somehow the dynamics of the table, the, the, the riffraff have all gone down there <laughs> and the three of us are at the top end uh, and, and the Syrian guys slipped me a little packet saying something of a crisis, not my kind of thing, but oh, everything's my kind of thing in the right moment. You know? <laughs> uh, I think you can take half of it back, that'll kill me the rest. Um, and sure enough, the, those two people um, uh, I'd, I'd come to keep in touch with. But I mean, the, the Syrian had been in, in Thailand and had known that I'd left there or heard the story uh, about it. But um, it was an extraordinarily small world. This is all that. We need to get some of these guys on the podcast. Um, look, I've tried this one, a couple of ex Bangkokers. Uh, in fact, there's an even uh, uh, a Facebook page of uh, former. Um, but they're so lazy, I think. Um, I mean, if you've got to talk and you've got something vaguely distracting, if not amusing to say, do it on Sean's channel, that's what it's here for. You know who I'm talking about, you people. Lazy, hiding behind. Why? I know three or four of you, because you think I'm going to bring up the fact you've got um, <clears throat> rather young girlfriends for people of your age in your 70s. We say, good luck to them. If they can cut the mustard at that age, the fact they've got a 20-something-year-old, you know, tie or... Filipino girlfriend. Hey, do we judge? We do not. Do we? No. We're almost at two hours, David. Have you got a, cliff, a cliffhanger to end this one on? I didn't even think. You know what? I've got, not that I need them, I've got like to section one of um, this is great. where this I wanted to get to. another ten parts out of you. Yeah, well. <laughs> okay, so um, now uh, I have flown back in to the UK, having, you know, it wasn't a lot in time, what, 18 months I spent fooling around with this nonsense, and I couldn't even be bothered going back to see my brother or, you know, Jeanette, or I, I just, uh, I had some friends who lived down on the coast, Littlehampton it is, it was, um, and I was, you know the guy I told you who died in um, the hotel room? Um, it was his parents' place, yeah. And they put me up. I don't think it would be so welcome there these days. I mean, I'm not to blame for the world's sins. Just because you've lost somebody to their own sporting recreation, 
was not in my hand or my fellows. Everything I have dealt with comes with a warning. Should be doing something else, you fools. Anyway, um, I mean, when it's all legalized, they'll have to deal with it one way or another, won't they? Right. Uh, so I, I was staying at the parents' place up in the loft, which had been a conversion, sitting in an armchair, evenings, have a and brandy on the rocks with a little lemon juice, staring over at the channel and keeping an eye on the French, as all proper Englishmen do. They can't be trusted, can they, the French? So we need to keep an eye on them. And there I was. What? You say we haven't been invaded by the French lately? I'm just wondering if we can even say that on YouTube these days. Well, the French, no, they're right. No, 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 no. <laughs> Snail-eating frog jumpers, I mean, so what? I like the Les Gago. Huh? Let's go for Les Gago, I always say. Anyway. I know, look, we have never been invaded by the French. They haven't raised a sword against us in recent times. But I did my time looking out, so, you know, don't thank them. I did love reading Napoleon um, stories when I was incarcerated. Oh, yeah, he was too big for his boots. He was a hell of a character. Mm. Hmm. He got a kind of traditional English end, though, didn't he? Where was it? On Elba. St. Helena. Yeah. Sent off there to a rot. Uh, yeah, so um, I tired of all, I didn't tire, but I could have sat there staring at the channel forever. Um, but I needed to, um, you can imagine how much is burnt. I've lost safety, but I've lost a lollipop man. He's not too happy. He's out, but, you know, I had to fund him back home and everything. And, uh I needed to go see my old friend Matthias in Germany because, you know, it's always good to keep one or two friends that no matter what, no matter how, you know, other people will say, Sean, but how could you get yourself in this situation? Well, what happened to all the money from this? What do you mean you haven't got a passport to piss on? <laughs> Not a pot to piss in there. Um, yeah, yeah, all right, never mind. I mean, the friends who don't even ask. So I flew to Germany, and um, Matthias was there. And Matthias has got a, a rather long story, um, and I think it's worth telling in a bit more detail. Definitely. But, um, and especially some tragic things at the end. But on this day, he and I were roaming out from his... And he was being a bit sarcastic about me, too. And I, I, mean, he's, I allow him that much. Anybody's going to give me a fistful of money and say, you know, go well, young man. Um, um, you know, because he said to me, uh, oh, good to see you, David. This was in Bad Nauheim. It's the town where Elvis Presley did his um, service in... Was it the Army or Marines? I don't know, somewhere, something like that. So it's little plaques all around town and lots to look at. So um, I'd go to the station at Frankfurt and then, and then Bad Naho and then walk to his place, see if there's any. I didn't want to infect his, his place. But, um, you know, he spoke um, English very well and, and he could use sarcasm in English uh, quite well, which was good too, no matter how intoxicated. Um, he said, I thought there used to be a, a, a girl, you know, she didn't know anything about what was going on. Uh, uh, yeah, well, I, I, I didn't really lie to her. I'm not lying now. I'm just not telling her the truth. Is that really lying? Oh, no, I suppose not, David. What do they call it? What do the priests call it? A sin of omission, don't they? That's a very small sin. I think you've got a very big place in hell, though, that goes <laughs> with it. <laughs> so he was a good guy, and we were out in, in the woods there uh, looking for... We'd give each other instructions as to where the money was hidden, you know, or some money or something, the goods. And he wanted... I was going to see whether I understood it properly. So it was um, find the right tree, find the right statue, um, but the snow had come down, so it looked a little bit different. Um, 
I was uh, I was looking for a set of twigs that had been made into a kind of straw man, that, um, like an arthritic kind of straw man. But eventually found it, and we um, managed to pull out a big, uh, like a, a plumber's tube piping, which is capped at the bottom, and slid down into the ground and buried that way. So it's it's vertical. You can it's kind of safer. It doesn't get earth movement crushing it or, or leaks. But girls and boys always put a silicon sleeve wrapping around that because you have trouble pulling the damn thing out if it's not double sleeved. And really, you know, it'll, it might be smooth plastic, but it would have grown into the, the soil a bit there. So a little bit of um, baking wrap if you haven't got anything else, but make, spend the extra money and get that silicon sleeving. Uh, and manage with gloved hands, me holding it, him twisting, open it up, and plopped out some whatever euros and uh, whatnot that uh, come out, a few other white torpedoes here and there. Um, and then um, we packed it all back up again, and uh, I had to then decide where to go and what to do. And that, everyone, is where we'll be heading next. Wow, absolutely fascinating. The level of detail that David just layers down into his stories and his amazing voice as well. That You can now get his audiobook and oh, listen, you can. listen to him. Listen no, to him. I, I think I'll be a leper once uh, Insiders finish with me. They asked me for some grubby details about things, which I gave them. I would hesitate. He's kind of giving me his hard copy of Unforgiving Destiny today. A moment of weakness, I don't know. Amazon is now doing hard copies. A good thing for gifts. I could even sign one for you, but uh, I don't know. I'd have to be persuaded. Nello.